Hi everyone. Could it be that you're just one bridge inspection away from having your daily life turned upside down? This happened in a community in western Colorado. US 50 over the Blue Mesa Reservoir had to be closed due to a sudden discovery of a crack in a welded steel structural member, a steel girder. And in this video, I'm going to go over what caused this cracking, what other bridges are susceptible, and what could be done about it. I'll also give you my estimate as to how long it's going to take to get this bridge reopened in western Colorado. I mean, it's had huge impacts to the local community, as I mentioned. Now they've got over a six-hour detour to get around this closed bridge. And it's impacted kids that are going to school, people who seek medical treatment uh, on a routine basis or regular basis for, say, kidney dialysis or cancer radiation therapy and other medical situations. So it's it had a huge impact. The local community has really embraced each other here. And there's people that live on the east side of the reservoir that need to go to school on the west side of the reservoir. And they've been taken in by people who live on the west side near school. They'll be there for several weeks. So the community's really rallying to try and do what they can to mitigate this situation. But it's, it's tough. Now, what led to this sudden closure was a crack in a weld, as I mentioned, and this bridge was made out of T1 steel. And it turns out that this T1 steel creates a situation that makes the weld susceptible to cracking over time. T1 steel was made by U.S. Steel Corporation. Really, it was started being used in bridges uh, more frequently in 1959 through the 1970s. This U.S. 50 bridge over the Blue Mesa Reservoir was completed in 1963, there are other names for this type of steel. Uh, grade ASTM 514, grade 100 steel, quenched and tempered steel, high strength steel, heat treated steel, and some combination of these. Now US Steel was founded in 1901 and they were recently acquired by Nippon Steel, just as an aside. But there are a number of bridges throughout the country that were made of this steel and past examples of cracking just like what happened on this Colorado bridge have, have occurred in the past. So I'm going to go through these examples and go through what, what can be done about it. The first known example of this type of weld cracking occurred for the I-64 Sherman Minton Bridge over the Ohio River between Louisville, Kentucky and New Albany, Indiana. It's a double-decker bridge. Lower deck was completed in 1961 and the upper deck was completed a year later. The bridge was closed September 9, 2011 due to the discovery of cracked welds, which they later determined dated back to the original construction, but went undiscovered for nearly 50 years. Next, we have the Hernando de Soto Bridge, I-40 over the Mississippi River. This bridge was completed in 1973. On May 11, 2021, an inspection revealed a cracked girder. The bridge was closed to all traffic, and no river traffic was allowed to pass under the bridge for a period of three days, which if you, I'm sure you all know the Mississippi River is a major shipping corridor for barges and other traffic, and that had a huge economic impact. In reviewing older photos that were taken by members of the public, it was discovered that that major crack existed at least as far back as 2016. So over f five years between the time that it could have been discovered to when it, it was. And there really wasn't any major accountability for this situation except to fire the inspector who was involved. So the word uh, scapegoat comes to mind. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have borne some responsibility here, but you can't tell me just one person was responsible for years and years of this crack not being discovered. And more recently, we have the Jennings Randolph Bridge, which carries US 30 over the Ohio River between Chester, West Virginia, and East Liverpool, Ohio. The bridge was built in 1977, again of T1 steel. The bridge was closed December 11th, 2023, due to two cracks in welds between structural members being discovered. Ironically, December 11th, 2023 is the same day that the Washington Bridge in Rhode Island had to suddenly be closed due to the discovery of broken anchor rods supporting the bridge. Now the Sherman Minton Bridge was closed for about five months while additional inspections and repairs were made to address this cracking. This cracking is called hydrogen cracking. And because the type of steel and the welding methods that were used result in the 
propagation or the initiation and later propagation of stress cracks due to cyclic loading. But uh, again, number, a number of these cracks were believed to have existed during the original construction time. The Hernando de Soto Bridge was closed for two and a half months, again, while they completed inspections and did repairs. And then you had the Jennings Randolph Bridge. It was closed this past December and was reopened uh, in f a period of under four months after repairs and additional inspections had been made. Now, as a result of the Sherman Minton Bridge closure and this I-40 episode, the Federal Highways Administration realized they had a widespread problem on their hands. So they issued this technical memorandum in order to direct states to compile a list of their bridges that were made of this T1 steel and to implement an inspection program to identify whether there's any cracking. Of particular concern was the soundness of butt welds in tension. And these welds were to be tested using non-destructive methods. And I'll go through what that can entail. So because of the Federal Highway Administration guidance, uh, this was the reason why the state of Colorado was conducting an inspection of the bridge over the Blue Mesa Reservoir. Now, it could be quite a challenge to do these inspections. You need specialized equipment like these uh, snooper trucks. They allow the crane boom and basket to be lowered underneath the bridge deck. So a person gets inside the basket and is able to do their inspection work in, in a close proximity to what they're examining. But one of the challenges with these types of inspections is they're very time consuming, uh, they're rather slow to conduct, and oftentimes you have other structural members obscuring the welds. So in addition to visual observation, you have the non-destructive test methods and uh, two types really of non-destructive methods for welds that are used uh, mag particle testing. So as the name implies, it uses magnetic particles, either a dry powder or a liquid. And a magnetic field is induced across the weld and these particles collect in the cracks and making them visible uh, in cases where they might not otherwise be visible to the naked eye. Another method is ultrasonic testing. The method involves getting a signal, an ultrasonic signal across the weld, and they're looking for instances where the weld doesn't fully penetrate or there's cracks in the weld. Now, as I mentioned, the Federal Highways Administration issued guidance in 2021 for these states to get a handle on their T1 bridges. And this is what I mentioned earlier. The main goal was to identify the bridges made of T1 steel and complete non-destructive testing of all the butt welds in critical areas. Now, it turns out there are a total of 64 bridges across the country that were built using this T1 steel among 20 states. California has the most with 11 bridges. Then you have Kentucky with seven, West Virginia with six, Colorado with five, and it goes on from there. So what do they have to do in Colorado to get this bridge open and the community back to some semblance of normalcy? Well, obviously they need to get better access to other welds. And again, they could do this with a snooper crane, but uh, a, a better way to access it is to create temporary scaffolding, which is what they're doing now. So they're gonna have to go through and look at all these welds uh, visually and then do the non-destructive testing, probably uh, the powder or the wet method for mag particle testing. Now, so far Colorado DOT officials haven't indicated the timeline for reopening in this bridge. Obviously, they have to get a handle on how many other cracks may exist, their location, what it's going to take to repair them, and then, and then re-weld those sections properly. So based on the timelines for these other bridges that had similar problems, I would think that Colorado could be able to get this bridge reopened in a period of less than three months. So the bridge was closed in mid-April. It's... Uh, we're probably looking mid-July and they should have this thing reopened based on, again, past experience at other projects. So to me, I think there's a deeper concern here in that Federal Highways Administration mandated these inspections and non-destructive testing. And I think in every instance, there's been other cracks discovered uh, following the initial discovery of one or more cracks on these bridges. So 
it may be that they have to go back to these bridges that were previously inspected and tested to, and do more extensive and more rigorous uh, testing to make sure that there's no other cracks. The insidious thing about these types of cracks in structural members is that they develop over time. Well, they may have existed at the time of original construction, but the cracks get bigger over time due to the cyclic loading of traffic. You know, the traffic has gotten uh, more voluminous uh, with higher loads over time. So as these bridges age, they become even more susceptible to problems. And uh, unfortunately, these cracks won't really fail until the load is high enough to cause that to happen, whether it's wind loading, earthquake loading, or more likely just a large amount of traffic on the bridge deck. So it's a very high risk and dangerous situation that I hope the feds and the states get to the bottom of as quickly as possible. So please let me know your thoughts in the comments section. I'd like to send a shout out to the channel members. I appreciate your ongoing support. I've been able to produce videos uh, at least weekly, if not more often. Also, I want to send out a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks. And of course, thank those of you who have liked, subscribed, and left comments. So thanks very much, everyone.